welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I'm the actor. And my name is Josh Knapp. I'm the broadcast engineer. All right, here we go, Josh. I got to start with uh, the ring lighting has been bothering me in our videos. So if I look <laughs> like I have bad posture tonight, it's because I'm trying to stay out of the ring lighting. I was going to do this, but then I thought, well... You know, that's definitively like somebody who's in my age range. So it just makes you look more learned, you know. It when does you have, have them down. Uh, oh, does it? Okay. See, it looks worse on these glasses. My, my glasses. Oh, <laughs> do, not it great. Again. No, do it again. Do it again. No. I look like um, I, I don't know. I look like Mr. Magoo or so. Well, I guess Mr. Magoo never had glasses, but I, I look like uh, yeah. I don't know. So he's got like way too huge glasses. Oh, I love it. So. I love it. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, Women Talking, which uh, is a movie uh, by written and directed by Sarah Pauly, a Canadian filmmaker who is also an actor, but but she's pretty much been focusing on making her own films um, and, and projects over the last couple decades. It's based on a 2018 novel by Canadian author uh, Miriam Taves. Taves. Yeah, I had to look yeah. it up. Yeah, um, like it's waves. About yeah, I know. I it's like, I, and I guess it's I don't know if that's Dutch or, or what it is, but um, yeah, it's it's something, a little funky there. The the spelling is T O E W S. So, yeah, I had to I had to look at that and be like, mm, I don't know. I gotta look that one up. Uh, so no, it's I'll... about women in a Mennonite colony who must decide to stay or leave when confronted with the fact that the men of the colony are to blame for the consistent sexual attacks that they've been subjected to, over many years. So pretty serious stuff so you you wanted to talk about this movie and i i can see why just from a like it took me 10 minutes and i was like oh this is a play so i i kind of want is that is that what drew you to it or is that why you wanted to really kind of like interact about it no i wanted to interact about it because I couldn't stop thinking about it when I first saw it. it. It stuck with me from the moment I left the theater, from the last shot of the film. And I felt uplifted as I was walking out of the theater. And then all of a sudden I was like, huh, wait. And I kept going back to the quote at the beginning of the film, which I don't know is, a, is it might possibly be a spoiler. I don't know if we talk about that, if that sets it up for people to not have the impact that I had. So maybe we can dance around it a little bit. And I don't think it's a okay. big spoiler, but it it, it 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 smacked me around when I went home and um uh, mm. which I guess is a bad uh way to put that, but it 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 it, it would not leave me alone. Mm. The the whole tone of the film and the way that it's shot in the cinematography is breathtaking and I have a couple thoughts about why they did what they did, at least from my point of view, how it impacted me. And I don't know. I thought about later, I thought about much later on about the one room scenario. And then I thought we're probably, go he's probably going to bring that up because we've talked about this a couple of times of how you can't get away from the trapping of it being stagey. If it's one room, the whale is one room. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of films that we've talked about, but what I found interesting about that topic, we'll start with that one. Uh, first of all, I love how we, we're joking and fooling around at the beginning of the podcast and immediately switched into something really serious without any well, transition. <laughs> yeah, you're right. But there was no transition. So no. yeah, but that's okay. I just wanted to recognize that it is. Well, a serious. I respect people's time. So yeah, you know. fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take that personally at all. No, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think it is, uh, it is a very seriously, uh, impactful, a uh, tonally film that should be taken serious. So I agree with you on that. So let's talk about the one room thing and because it was a play. No, I don't think that has anything to do with what uh, uh, made me feel what I felt. But I mm -hmm. do want to discuss the one room thing for just a brief second because I was thinking about this and I thought, is it because we are in the information age of uh, big pictures, uh, Avengers, Marvel Universe, all this fast kinetic everything everywhere all the time stuff and uh, is it because we can instantaneously stream anything and we have we can go to anywhere. I took a drive through Lewiston which is the town that this play that I'm doing is set in. I actually took a virtual drive and you know somebody put a dash cam and went through the town. It was fascinating but hmm. you know is it because we have been uh, uh, 
we have been treated to all of this very fast paced stuff and we are able to just switch something off and switch something on and stop something and put something into place because then I thought about uh, our top 10 and The Breakfast Club being my number one. That's a one room film with the exception of a little bit at the beginning, a little bit at the end and some stuff in the middle where different rooms the hallways are, and the hallways stuff, yeah. and then the detention room or the smaller detention room that mm -hmm. um, he's put into. Or closet, I guess. Anyway, so nobody back then discussed the fact that they had a problem with it being a one-room uh, movie. Same with Rope. No one ever talks about that. As a matter of fact, those two films are applauded for being one-room and what they did with the one-room. And so I would have to say that Sarah Pauly did a great job with the one-room idea. The way that she films it and the way that I think that if it didn't take place in one room, we might not. I might not have felt what I felt. And that small little picture window in the background the whole entire time of the the farmland that goes on forever and ever and ever out the barn uh, door or a uh, window or upstairs. It's like an, an access area. Yeah, 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 yeah where I guess they the get hay in yeah, and out. Yeah. yeah, and they use it later on in the film. Yeah. So I think it's important that it was like that. So I don't understand why we can't handle one room films anymore. I, I, it's an interesting I, thing to think about. Well, and I think for me, it wasn't necessarily that that I didn't feel like I I couldn't handle it, but I when when confronted with a movie like this, which does primarily happen in one room, it begs the question of like, why is this a movie? Like, why why do we make the this a movie versus making it a play? Uh, I mean, if we're going to have actors acting out these parts, I mean, it was a book, obviously it's, it's a, it's a adaptation of a book, but you can have plays that are adaptations of books also. So th then that's the question is like, what in, what is Sarah Pauly doing to, to make this cinematic and what does a cinematic treatment of this story do that a play doesn't do? So that's what I was trying to, to tease out throughout the film. And I was talking with Steph a little bit afterwards. She, she ended up not going with me to see it, but, um, but still, uh, it, there's only one theater in the Raleigh Durham Metro area. And actually, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, <laughs> it was hard to see this movie like recently just because it's been it's kind of come and gone and it's not available on streaming yet and all that stuff but um but i'm glad it, that i sought it out so um so that all that being said i was when i was sitting in the theater i was trying to figure out like what what is it that um that lends itself to uh this being a cinematic experience versus uh would i have been just as satisfied with uh, a play experience and I think that there you're right the cinematography is something that is definitely highlighted the score is is pretty good I mean it's not I'm not kind of bowled over by it it, it is Hildur Guanadatir who won uh, Academy Award for Joker um, so those two things are things you don't necessarily get in in a play um, and then uh, I, I I think that the acting is top-notch and it would have been top-notch if it was a you know the all of these same actors in a play too but um, but I think that they do enough like you said with cinematography with shot selection there's a lot of shots like looking down um, especially during the aftermath of uh, the women waking up from mm. from their their sexual attacks, and and that's all purposeful, and that's and the framing of the the interactions, and the fact that men are never seen, the adult men are never seen really in the film. Um, it, it's and also adult men other than uh, August aren't heard from in the film like they, they are purposefully left out. I mean you you know so so those are those are huge. Uh, choices that that Sarah Pauly makes in, in the film and I think that they all play out really well there's uh, one character that you would expect to be a huge character in the film and she is uh, the, and the, the character herself takes herself out of the film so and it, that's that's also another another bold choice um, so I think those are those are um, some of the things that I thought as I was as thinking about the movie and as I was was you know thinking about driving home and stuff I was just kind of like yeah I 
it would work as a play, but I think that Sarah Pauli does enough to make it as in, uh, an engaging film. Um, the color grading on it is, Spectacular. is a bold choice. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, mean, I, I couldn't is... figure it out for the longest time, and then I thought about it. But hold on real quick. Let me yeah. just go back to something. So I, I was listening to you, but I was also trying to answer the question in my head, why not make it a play versus a movie? But the ultimate question is, why not make it a movie? Why does it have to be that it's set in one room, that it's only a play? And I think the subject matter is the reason why you can make it a movie. The subject matter is something that needs to be heard and seen on that kind of level, not that you can't see it on stage and not that this couldn't yeah. be adapted. And this has been happening throughout our entire lifetime where they're yep. they're having movies. Moulin Rouge is now adapted into a Broadway show. Yep. Uh, School of Rock was adapted into a musical. And um, so it... It, it can be done and it could possibly be done very well. And the things that your mind fill in for you on stage when you're watching something on stage, the cinematography and the score and the uh, shot selection, as you called it, uh, fill in for you as a movie event. And I think that you should never I don't think anybody should stray away from making a movie just because it might not be considered cinematic it might not be the best choice for the subject matter but you know, it's like you you read a book you watch a movie you watch a play it's three entirely different things to me depending on where I'm at in my life sometimes they match up sometimes they don't so I think the subject matter uh, warrants a much larger audience than what a play can do. Now, a play can go regionally. A play can be community. A play can be Broadway. A play can be all over West End. You know, the National Theater, all that stuff. It can be. It can be. Uh, uh, Tyler Perry did it the best with all of his Medea shows. I mean, he took those all over the country and he spread that word uh, literally uh, and figuratively all over the country and got to him big audience that way before those movies were ever made. So could you do that? Yes. But there's something uh, important and pressing about this subject matter that a bigger audience deserves to be a part of. Mm -hmm. You're right. And then also, I think just to drive that point home, you're, you're, you're right. More people are going to see this movie because it was nominated as a, a, a best picture nominee. Thank so, goodness. Yeah. And so that's going to get, I mean, probably more when it, comes out on uh, streaming. I know it, it hasn't, it wasn't as successful in the box office, but they're either going to re-release it in theaters and, or have it, have it made available. I think it's probably going to be on prime. It's an MGM movie, I think. So, um, so it's probably going to be available, uh, on prime, uh, Amazon prime uh, in a month or so. So hopefully people, it, it'll probably be made available right around the time that the, um, that the Oscars happen. So that, that will hopefully be another uh, boon for this film and get people to interact with it. And then, and then hopefully open up uh, dialogue about uh, some of the subject matter. Um, did you, uh, di did you see like a, a corollary to like the Me Too movement in the, um, in the, the, in Hollywood, in the Hollywood industry or whatever? Where kind of it's it's women, you know, kind of coming together and kind of deciding, not not necessarily deciding definitively, but also, but but basically like, you know, coming together as a group and and kind of saying like, you know, these are the the minimums that that we will that we will handle. You know, that this is the the baseline. We're not going to get get attacked. You know, that's that's number one priority. We're not going to get attacked. And that's essentially what they said. Now they have to decide whether to, you know, I mean, their three choices were uh, do nothing, stay and fight and leave. And then they all voted at the beginning and then they tied between stay and fight and leave. So those two choices, both uh, everyone agrees that they're not going to just let this keep going on. So, I mean, did you see any kind of a parallel there? Well, uh, no, but it's, I see why people might, and I think that's okay. And I think this film could have been made 20 years ago. I think this film could have made, been made uh, 50 years ago. I think this film could have been made 30 years in the future. And I, I, I see how somebody could, but I don't think that's essential in the watching of this subject matter to relate to it. 
uh, possibly to help people get through the stuff that they've been through, sure. Um, but I didn't connect it to until you just said that. But also, we also have to state for an obvious fact that we are men in this society and the, the, the things that we go through or the things that I've been through, I won't speak for you, have never come anywhere close to this. Uh, and the groups of women that I have listened to and that people have uh, talked to me about, it's rampant and it's just, it, it's just one of those things. It's just like part of their life. And, you know, I had somebody tell me once, uh, when your boss comes in the room and he's inappropriate, you can feel the difference between somebody shaking your hand one way and somebody shaking your hand another way. You know, you just know. And I said, well, is that because you've had to be paranoid of that or because it exists or what? And she said, it's just part of being a woman in this society. Um, and you know, she's from America. I can't speak of anywhere else and I can't really speak on the subject because that's her story. But she made it known that, you know, women don't like to live on first floor apartments for all the obvious reasons. They don't like to walk by themselves. They can't walk by themselves. They can't go out past a certain time by themselves. They can, but then they take a chance that uh, might never affect us. I mean, it could on some level, but it more than likely won't knock on wood. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm dancing around a subject that I don't have firsthand knowledge of, and I don't want to sound like a mansplainer. I hate that. I hate that people are trying to like explain other people's lives. All I can talk about is how I felt when I saw this movie. So are people being helped by this because of the Me Too movement? Then yeah, I think that's great. I think I understand how people could put the two together. Did I relate it to that? No. I, all I saw was the story in front of me and mm -hmm. the impact it had on me. And the questions I have are completely different than a question uh, people who've been in that uh, or been in that situation would be asking themselves. I don't know if that's a roundabout way of trying to not answer what you just said, but well, I don't yeah. know if it's important to me. It's, me too is important to me, no doubt about it. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I don't know if it's important if I related it to that or not. The storytelling captivated me in a way that all I thought about is that story. For me, the the big the big tie in for that was like I, I was like I can see the corollary, but what they did, uh, what Sarah Polly did in, in choosing this story, if in fact she did want to make uh, uh, make it somewhat of an allegory for the Me Too movement, is that she made the the actions of the aggressors egregious, like completely just unquestioningly unacceptable and and horrendous. And so I think that a lot of the stuff that, that gets um, a lot of stuff that dilutes the, you know, the dialogue in the Me Too movement is is talking about like, well, was it really that bad? Or, you know, and it's like this is a completely like there is no chance that anyone who has a soul would think that any of this stuff is OK. So that right there is is, I think, a good way of just kind of saying like, get on board or like you're going to be on board with this, you know, with, with these women. Um, another thing that I, that I really, uh, that I thought was, was really incisive was that I didn't know anything about the movie. I hadn't seen the trailer, hadn't seen any trailers, hadn't read anything about it, nothing, because I love doing that whenever I can to, to try to like just ex experience a movie sight unseen, like m most people did before. I don't know the 1970s <laughs> i mean because really i don't know when they started you know showing you know uh trailers for movies when you're not in a movie theater you know like on tv and stuff so because at this point it's kind of hard to not see whatever the newest transformers trailer or whatever you know like big budget movie or like the ant-man quantumania trailer you know that's out all now. over the it's, place yeah it's everywhere like, you can't get away from it so like you i really know that, can't i know that king the conqueror is in there i just do you know whether i want to or not so that right there uh, i with this movie i was able to go in uh and completely get um you know get surprised by a lot of things but then one thing another thing i noticed was that they're, they don't give you a very clear picture of what the issue is uh, immediately. They just start to, to give you li little uh, small pieces of information. And each piece of information you get about the, the recurring attacks on these women, it gets worse and worse and worse until you get close. I mean, you actually see the, um, the Salome character played by Claire Foy. You see her uh, go after 
a, a guy with a, a like a, a sheath, a, a scythe. You know, like she is going after him. He's in like the bathroom or something, or in the you know the, the outhouse. And and so you're like, whoa, that's you know that's extreme. But then once you find out why she's reacting the way that she's reacting, like you, which is half the movie later you you realize that 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 she's completely just overcome with just horror and emotion and 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 that's that's how she she has to to react so um so yeah i i thought that that was a good way to to drive the story forward to to keep people uh, to keep the audience engaged in in kind of like always being like you know, even if you're kind of like, okay, so, you know, what are, what are their main issues? Why are they going, going through this? Or why, why are they, uh, you know, having issues with the men in the colony? Well, you find out, you know, especially as, as you get further down the, the film, that it's just the, the, the things that these men are doing are just absolutely horrendous. And so, yeah, then you get to determine or help, you know, see them determine what they want to do if they want to stay and fight or leave. So we got to get back to the cinematography, but I want to make a, a couple points about, or a point about what you were just talking about. See, I saw it from the very beginning. I saw that their their reason for gathering was as important as knowing what they had to go through before they they even showed what they went through. I just saw it. I knew it. But I've also been educated on a lot of these subjects as much as I possibly can be about, you know, women don't lie about this stuff the majority of the time. Uh, you know, the higher percentages, they just don't. So to assume that, um, it, like when you said about, uh, well, is it really that bad? I get what point you're making, but it's infuriating to think that that's even part of the conversation. And what's interesting about this film is they tap into that, but it's some of the women even the angry people who are attacked, Jesse Buckley in particular, Mm -hmm. in a a missed Oscar nomination, even though I love all five of the people who are nominated this year, will never say anything bad about any of them. But it is a shame this is the movie this year because she should have gone for her second nomination because she is just sharp as attack. They're all great, but there's something, something about her that's just, oh, and she's playing an... uh, uh, one might say an unlikable character. Uh, she has a position that she has to play, and that's that's the, yeah. the point you were just talking about. Later and on, we you don't know figure, what her motivation exactly, is exactly until then, the end, essentially yeah, close exactly, to the end. Exactly. So that's and then what, it all comes together. And yeah. You're like, oh, no wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, so, just a little bit tap into that. But back to what we were talking about the cinematography. Uh, Okay, I've been looking online for the uh, opening quote to the film, and I can't find it, so I don't remember it exactly, but uh, a little bit of a spoiler, I don't think it's going to hurt anything to talk about it, but it goes somewhere along the lines of, uh, this story is true, but sort of made up at the same time. I I can't remember the quote exactly, but it, it, you remember what I'm talking about in the very beginning. Do you happen to the remember? voiceover? Yeah, yeah, it's one of the one of the younger daughters uh, talking to the un, to Rooney Mara's unborn child. Yeah, right. And do you remember what she said? Like better than how? No. Well, anyway, halfway through the film, I couldn't understand why it was so muted and why it was so specifically muted. And then you see, by the way, side note, uh, they never mention what kind of community this is. They only say community. They never say Mennonite. It happens to be, this is based on something that happened to the, well, the author was Mennonite for until she was 18 years of age. So people have interjected that, but they never say specifically what this community is. They only f- refer to it as community, which I thought was a brilliant choice because it's not about this particular community. It's about what's happening to women all over the world and have been for the entire existence of the human race. So this is just specifically about this community. Okay, so there's a shot where you see... Um, some of the young women walking and you could tell that there's red or burgundy in some of their dresses. Like the flowers have almost a rose kind of color into them. And I was like, why would they mute that? So why would they make it so dull? And you could tell it's a little shiny, but it's the cinematographer decided to mute all that. I couldn't figure out for the life of me why they did it. And then it dawned on me because this is somebody's imagination. This is somebody's 
re- this is somebody remembering. This is like a dream where you don't really dream in color, but you think you do. So you put color to it later on. At least that's what they tell me. I sometimes think I dream in color, but I don't know what the theories behind that is. Um, I seem to remember certain colors when I wake up. Yeah. And I thought, that is the most brilliant choice in the world because, hyperbole, because it makes you realize that the end of the movie, did it happen? Did it not happen? Is it just a wannabe ending to a movie? So that's why I was saying I was uplifted. Then all of a sudden it was flattened out when I went, oh, wait, I don't think this is factually correct. I don't think this actually happened. I don't think they actually uh, end up doing what they do at the end of the film. I don't know if that's just an imagination of somebody who wants to be able to do something like that. And that saddened me on so many levels that we can't even have a person tell a true story where they rose above it because they can't get out of it. They can't get out of what men are doing to women on a regular basis in this world. And it flattened me on a level. So I don't know how you felt about the cinematography, but I've seen, I've not seen anything that drastic since the aviator. Uh, Not to I compare was, the two. Well, but. and I was actually thinking about um, uh, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Mm. Because that was one of the first instances of using a digital intermediate. So they shot it on film, but then they scanned it into a computer. This is like 2001. Mm. They scanned it into a computer um, and they did color correction on that. They turned all the green leaves, br- you know, tan, brown color. They did they did some extreme stuff. The Coen brothers did some extreme stuff. And, and Roger Deakins like, got really into it like he was really excited about it but that's the kind of like choices that i think that they made i mean there was once it it did a lot for certain scenes there was one scene where you see it's an accelerated uh uh sunset uh where they're looking out through they're they're in the the barn and they're looking out through that main main uh area the access area and you see the sun set and i mean you know, if you watch the sunset, you you can kind of see the sun kind of go below the horizon, but you don't see it doesn't go that fast usually. So there was some a bit of like trickery going on there, but it was very effective to to kind of like uh, bring out the urgency of what they were doing. Uh, I think that the whole concept uh, and and uh, can, the the conceit of the of the setup of we have less than 48 hours to make this decision and, and either go or, you know, have a, a consolidated front for when the men come back. All of that is, is a little bit far-fetched anyway, because why would all of the men go to town to bail out one person? It's, okay. I thought it was like eight people they were ba- bailing out. Okay. See, oh, okay, I'm, well, I'm, I'm getting multiple I'm, people, but I'm yeah, getting I guess it was from, multiple people. Okay. But that actually happened. That actually happened. They, um, they all, oh, in Bolivia where the, yes, the story yes. was based? The whole okay. male town or community left to go stand and say, no, 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 you're not going to prosecute these people. They they were outside the Okay, courtroom. so it was like a representation of the— Well, it's okay. almost, I mean, I, I'm a little bit more skeptical than your, your good heart. I think it's a bullying tactic. I think it's or, a, or that an too. intimidating way, but, tactic. So, yeah, yeah I, I just, buy it. I buy okay. it. Okay. Well, and that makes a little bit more sense, I guess. And the only reason why the one character Klaus comes back is because they need more money. Like, I mean, I I can I can understand that part. I, I understand certain things, but I guess I just didn't realize it's kind of like, you know, everybody doesn't need to go and pick up Aunt Doreen at the airport. You know, you just send one person and then they'll go pick them up. And but you that's know, not the, that's not the point it, of that though. Okay. Yeah. The point and, is, is that so they were going to, they're going to stand and say, uh, not only did this not happen, not only do we support these men, not only should they not be prosecuted, prosecuted, but we're going to stand and we're going. And this is words I've read, so this mm, isn't coming okay. from me. That they were bullying is my term, mm-hmm. um, but they were saying this is our religious right, this is our yeah. uh, community right. This is what. That's why I wanted to make the point about Mennonite and not it not being a specific community that she she names in the film because it's mm-hmm. about it's bigger than the community this subject matter yeah. so those men went and pretty much round the clock for two or three days circled okay. that courthouse until you know they got what they wanted <laughs> and all right so i don't remember exactly how it ends but i know that it did happen like that and i think that it also speaks to the fact that that community 
can survive without them. 100% and it's two days. Yeah. Um, it, 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 the women are needed more than the men in that community. The men could disappear for two days, which is a statement in itself, um, and nothing falls apart in the community. They still, the Francis McDormand character who you uh, made reference to earlier, uh, she goes back to weaving or sewing or whatever she's doing. They're still going, you see the little girls doing the water and you see people out in the fields doing their things and milking the cows and walking the horses and all the stuff that they do. And it's a statement about how not only about the abuse that these women go through, but without them, this community would fall apart. It wouldn't exist. And that, with the ending, the way that they end this film, is impactful because if they do do what they do at the end of the film, then what does happen when the men come back? Yeah. What what happens to the community? Or the consequences of their actions uh, vibrate differently because they come back to what they come back to. So I I don't think it's I wouldn't say it was far fetched. I would say that it was it's a convenient movie yeah. trope, if you will. Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a setup that was necessary. That was the only way they were gonna be able to all get in get together inside one room and talk with each other without men being like, What are you doing? Why are why are you what why are you all together? You know And it's a little while into the film, not long, but a little while into the film before you find out that the men are all gone. So yeah. I'm haunted by that in the first 15 minutes of that film. Like I'm always like, why isn't there somebody by the door listening? Why isn't, mm -hmm. how are they getting away with this? Why isn't, you know, Oh no, uh, it, it, it made me nervous. But then yeah. I found out that they were all gone and that's why they could gather, which also yeah. made me nervous. <laughs> mm, yeah. So, uh, one, <laughs> one last thing about kind of like the, the, the look of the film and, and the kind of like, for me, that, 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 extreme color grading also made it seem like it was um I, I was trying to pinpoint throughout the film like when are we and then as the movie goes on i'm like okay i see that they've got buggies made with essentially like modified uh vehicle axles with with auto like car tires on there and so i was like okay so it's definitely in the 1900s and then so and then when the census taker comes through with his truck uh which is a you know 1970s early 1980s truck or whatever um and then i hear you know uh what was it uh daydream believer i hear daydream believer and i'm like okay then so we're probably in you know whatever the the late 70s or something but then he says, like, come out for your 2010 census. And the, that was actually a reveal for me, even though that's in the trailer. But it was definitely a reveal for me. And it makes it even more impactful when you hear about the uh, Salome character having to walk her four-year-old child two days to someone who has antibiotics. And that, I was just kind of like, it's 2010. Like, the, this is... It's just, I mean, go to the Walmart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, but she yeah. can't. She, she can't. can't. I'm not being cynical about no, her no, no, not no. being but able for to. Us, I'm it, saying it wouldn't be like, yeah, for for us or most of the people, probably maybe all the people that we each know, it it, it wouldn't be as as extreme as as essentially like life threatening uh, on multiple levels to get antibiotics for for a family member. Patients so. first. I mean, yeah. you know, but I think that's fascinating. That's that's how Sarah Pauly did it, because if you don't know what time frame it is, then you discover the tires, then you discover the buggies, then you yeah. discover the truck, then you discover the song, then you discover the actual time frame. You go, oh, this is happening all well, over time. This is not one oh, specific yeah. set of time. This is it, all... It, it's I not think I'm bound. Looking a little, yeah. Right. It's not bound. I, I think maybe I'm looking a little too much into that, but if that's what she did, you know... <laughs> It might be a cause for a discussion about her not being nominated for Best Director. So, mm. yeah, I mean, we can discuss it later, which we will. Um, <laughs> but it does, It I love bold choices. I said that on the last podcast. But I also like when something is so subtle, it hits you on an, a, 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 an emotional level, almost subconscious level. And then as we're talking about it, I went, oh, 
why is it Daydream Believer? Why isn't it something from Jay-Z or whatever it may be in 2010? Mm-hmm. Why isn't it some epic U2 song, you know, like uplifting thing to get them to pay attention? Why is it that song? And yeah. it could be that it's a light pop song that they don't get to ever really listen to and that, you know, the whole daydream idea of dreaming yep. outside the well, box. in the and, book, it was California Dreaming by the Mamas well, and the Papas. Well, there you go. So, so I think it, it was kind of a playoff on that. It's all about, you know, dream dreams. And that also plays into your, your theory about, like, the, is this actually really happening or is this all, <laughs> you know, a collective you know, a dream that these women would potentially only be able to think of doing this as opposed to really doing it. So, or if- a separation of somebody who is in an abusive situation and their personality or their, their character separates. And it's they, like a coping mechanism. Co- yes. Yeah, so unfortunately, during the abuse, she could have separated into thinking, well, you know, had this daydream when this abuse was going on to keep her mind from completely shattering, which is Mm. impossible. Um, And yeah, it's fascinating the choices that Sarah Pauly made. It's fascinating to me. Uh, Screen wise, uh, screenwriting wise too. The choices are, I can't wait to see it again. And I'm not sure how quick I'm going to jump on seeing it again because it was daunting. It was Uh, powerful and I don't know if I want to be in the world again right now but when I do it's going to be interesting to pick up on things that I wasn't really sure of one real quick thing back to cinematography I love the difference between how she shot the boys in school and on the fence and playing around and in particular the way that she shoots them uh when they're playing with the the girls it's a different look it's a different Mm. feel it's almost uh, more polished. It's almost brighter. It is brighter. Um, because I think that's reality. That is real. That is true. This mm-hmm. that we're watching is either a coping mechanism or a dream that somebody needs or an imagination of what could be if only women came together and stood. You know, if they could, yeah. if they are capable, not capable, but if they have the ability to just talk for 48 hours, maybe they can rise above their situation. I don't know. I'm idealistic about things like that. I'm hopeful about things like that. So I don't know. But it was fascinating how she, it, how she even shot the boys when they're when he's doing that speech about, yeah, don't trust them. Mm-hmm. Any, any, any boy over this age, don't trust them. Here's why she shoots them halfway with their heads cut off a yep. lot of the times. Well, and it's, I, it's close ups. I mean, that's, that's yeah. how those close ups are done a lot and they're straight on too. Whereas a lot of the times when, when we're, when we're in that room, uh, when we're in that, that barn, uh, a lot of it is angled. The, a lot of the shots are, are angled and kind of not, um, there's not a lot of straight on shots. I mean, that's not a normal shot really as as a straight on kind of like looking into the camera type, type of a shot anyway, but it's, it is during that voiceover, the Ben Wishaw voiceover there. Yeah. You, you do get to see a lot of those. And then, uh, they do have a couple other shots of, of the, the boys interacting with each other, but, but mainly it's just those, like you said, you know, it's those kind of like portrait shots, of, of those boys and trying to like, cause you're trying to figure out as an audience, we were trying to figure out like, does this, whatever, you know, 11 year old kid have the capacity to do what these other men did in this community. And, you know, you're, and he's explaining it to you at that point, you know, it's like, yeah, they do, but yeah, you know, there, but ho- all hope is not lost. Um, for, for them. So, um, all right. I think we should probably move into spoilers a little bit more so we can talk a little more freely. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about, um, the screenplay and and the kind of the plot and all that stuff. Um, and it did remind me of, uh, 12 angry men because Mm. you're essentially kind of like all in a group and you have to come to a, a, a consensus. You have to come to an agreement on what the next step forward is. And, at the beginning, there's there's decidedly three camps, and then, of course, uh, Frances McDormand hightails it out of there and just broods in her in her house for an hour and fifteen minutes, 
And so everybody Why, she's else producing the film and getting know, everything right? to work it's, in the background. So I it's mean, crazy. she, so she that, is that the was, producer of the film. So that was the thing I was reading. She's through, busy. I was reading through some stuff and I was just like, it was like the first thing, the first uh, actor that was attached to this movie was Frances McDormand. And it's like, she probably got this movie made to a certain extent, her and Sarah Polly, obviously. But like when Sarah Polly comes to you and is like, Hey, you know, I'd love for you to be a part of this. And then she's like, of course, yeah, I'll executive produce it. I'll, you know, help you out in any way or whatever. But it, it's one of those like bait and switch type things maybe or whatever, you know, where it's kind of like, I mean, and Brad, Brad Pitt kind of does it too. He's one of the executive producers. When you look at Burn After Reading, you know, he's he's one of those guys that... Um, what just happened? I don't know. Your your light just went like that was super bright. Weird. and Weird. Like, that was crazy. Uh, I thought that was weird. I thought it's the be- aliens. I thought the spy, well, the Chinese spy balloon aliens were coming. Oh, out here we go. <laughs> um, okay, I was checking my phone to look to see if she was executive producer or producer because I was just curious. And then uh-huh. I looked up and I was like, "What's just happened there? That was weird." <laughs> that was weird. Okay, I'm glad you saw it too because at first I was like, "Am I having <laughs> some kind of something happening here?" No, no, you're okay. you're okay. Um, uh, yeah, so she was a producer, not an executive producer. Um, so Brad she does Pitt. most. The reason why I mentioned that is because she's done most of the legwork to get yep. this film made. Executive yep. executive producers, not that that's any slack yep. of a job, but they're paying. They're the money. Yeah. Well, the it's, producers yeah, are like, B. hey, we need this, we need this, we need this, yeah. we need this, we need this set, we need that set. Project yeah. Green Green Light taught me all that stuff yeah because so. so plan b is is brad P. he's one of the people you know who started that company plan b so you're right he you know writes a check and and you know does whatever talks about it or whatever when whenever people ask but but he's not integral to the the making of the film necessarily whereas francis mcdormand you know was well and she will win the oscar if they win best picture Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, and so the, but, but I thought it was really cool that, that Frances McDormand is, is kind of like, you know, she's like, yes, I'm the star of this movie or whatever. You know, it's like, sure. I've won some Academy Awards. Okay. I'll, I'll be the star of this movie. And then, you know, (laughs) sure, sure. Actually four actually. Yeah. Wow. Jeez. Yeah. For producing, uh, Nomadland. Nomadland. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, so, Anyway, I mean, that's the other thing is that, like, hopefully that was one of those things where it's like, yes, we can get Rooney Mara in here. We can get uh, Claire Foy in here. We can get Jesse Buckley in here. And we can get all these other... Uh, she, uh, Sarah Polly also used a lot of uh, Canadian actresses, and, and they were they're, they were amazing. Um, uh, well, speaking was, of which, Michelle McLeod, uh, uh, the smoking one. I don't know how yep. else to d- identify her because that's very it's a very distinctive thing that she goes through with the smoking mm-hmm. she talk about a possible oscar nomination she's a standout in this film and she's virtually unknown to me yeah. and i went and looked her bio up and i was like oh i've seen her in a couple of things but i didn't know her by name but i did recognize her and i thought i think this is a, a kind of a role that she's not normally been cast in if you will but man mm-hmm. she is she holds her own and amongst that cast she's yeah. a standout to me that that's hard to do. I mean, she yeah. did her job very well. Very oh, yeah. well. Definitely. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that uh, I was kind of uh, interested in seeing all of that kind of cook throughout the film and see how they kind of like progress from, uh, okay, you know, we're all kind of like half of us are on this side, half of us are on the, on the other side. And multiple characters, the Rooney Mara character, um, uh, Ona, she kind of starts on one side and then she, like, she starts on the, we should stay and fight and we should establish, uh, you know, the schooling for, for the, the girls and we should, you know, teach them how to read and all of the, you know, like that's where she's, she's, you know, staking her, her claim. And then by the end, when, when they realize that, that, the only like that there's no way i mean it's essentially the you know the salom character claire foy saying like I, i'm it's going to turn me into a murderer like i will kill someone because of what they did to my 4 year old daughter so i mean it's it's that kind of a thing where they're like you have to understand and realize what the limitations of uh <laughs> the limitations uh, of 
people are and what they can can handle, what they can can get through, and then also like what their it's essentially their prime directive. Their prime directive was to not be violent, and and the only way for these women to do that that they decide is is if they leave. So, well, isn't I mean, there an expression yeah. about don't become a monster to fight a monster? There's some expression like that. So, and oh, I think God. that uh, Rooney Mara, her being pregnant, mm -hmm. that's so complex. And then you find out she's pregnant from one of her abusers. Yeah. And that's due to rape. More, yeah. Oh, so, so complex and so infinitely sad and the it's so thought provoking. I I went yeah. deep into a rabbit hole when I figured out that what was going on with her, but yeah. ultimately that's why she chooses to leave because mm -hmm. the love she ha already has for the baby and she expresses that exact thought. It outweighs what Claire Fo Foy Claire Foy ha has said. It outweighs it. So the only choice she has is to leave because she is going to raise this baby in love. And she can't raise a baby in love, worry about it being abused if it uh, born a female, worried about her being abused again, worried about her kids and their kids and grandchildren, and live in love. She can't do it. So yep. it's not as severe as what Claire Foy says, but it's on the same playing field that if I stay, this will twist the love I have for my unborn child into something that it should never be. It's not about the fact that the unborn child is a product of rape. It's not about that. That's not what's going to twist me. What's going to twist me is having to worry, having to be concerned, having the to risk, the risk and not being able mm -hmm. to love my child unconditionally. And that is an unfair proposition. So bye. Yep. I'm gone. And, you know, we haven't even talked about the Melvin character, but, but that whole, uh, you know, character, you know, was, was able to, I mean, had to go through a, a very, uh, you know, difficult thing. And, and I mean, that, <laughs> that, yeah, that, that's, that's such a complex character. I mean, and they do explain the, the, uh, Melvin character as someone who never, uh, who was never a woman and, and, and making the, making that, character have to go through what they went through and they're very they're very explicit about it being the 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 baby being a child of incest and 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 all of that i, I mean uh, i hope that that doesn't you know muddy the waters of you know what the the melvin character was feeling when they you know presented uh physically as a woman uh er, early on in their life so um that's yeah it's a lot to to bite it, off. It is that, a lot. That character is a lot is, to bite off. It, but as they a, handle you know, it so well. They yeah. and here's how they handle it. They never speak when in front of adult, an adult. He never speaks in front of an adult and never breaks that, not for a split second, not even at the detriment of a child. Mm. They he whatever the pronoun is that they use, because I'm not exactly sure, I think it's he, him, but, and I respect that, but the fact that they don't speak literally speaks volume for that, volumes for that character. They are so who they are that they're not breaking a vow, even if it means helping a child, yeah. but yet speaks clearly and fluently to a child yeah. without any trappings whatsoever, but essentially is a moot person, mute, mute, mute. person. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, moot point, mute person. Um, and almost if you were introduced to the character as a non-speaking character to an adult, you would think that they might have some kind of physical thing or psychological thing, but yet then they speak to the children mm -hmm. and you're like, Oh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and this might be my capacity to take things in. It's almost just a tad but bit too much. You have all of these characters. You have all of these situations. I love that she represented Sarah Pauly and the uh, writer, the uh, the author. I love that they represented, but 
it was all like uh, Ben uh, Whitshaw. Whitshaw. Yeah, Whitshaw. Um, his character's a bit much for me. Like, that, I was going to ask you a, about it's that. It's just a little, I get it. He's fantastic. His, his but vibe is that way too. And, and he's like, it seems like he's the only one who they left behind because they either knew he wasn't going to be on board with what they were doing. Or, I don't think they know. Or, okay. Well, I don't think the men know. Because they probably wouldn't allow him to teach their kids. You or know, they their, probably their wouldn't boys. allow the women to stay by themselves if they thought something was going to brew. They well, had no idea that was that was happening. None. That, that they left too. the drunk and the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Because but, they're they're not going they're not gonna do anything. They're I don't think that they find the teacher a representative of any of it. The men I don't think think, oh, he's gonna hold down the fort. He's yeah. just not them. He's not he's them. Also a he's a well educated person. He's a necessary evil or not necessary uh a liability or whatever you want to call it. Like he needs to be there to teach their sons the the things that they can't teach their sons. You mean in general or for the two days fact, that they're gone? Facts that the, oh no 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 oh uh, just in general no just in general like that's okay. why they oh. let him back because his his whole family was excommunicated right right because right, his right. mom asked questions right <laughs> so and then and then he wanted to come back that was the I had a couple questions about him number one why did he want to come back did he want to come back for Ona for the Rimara character because he knew that she wasn't. Uh, married and that she was pregnant and that he wanted her to not be, you know, c- considered a spinster or be considered a, you know, some sort of like sinful person or whatever, even though she had nothing to do with getting pregnant or any of it. Like, um, so I think, you know, that, that was the only kind of impetus that I saw for him to come back. And then, so in a lot of ways, like he's one of the, he, he is, uh, uh such a sad character by the end because he has like has nothing to live for you know as far as like if you wanted to say that that was his main focus uh but but he's his purpose has been transitioned into preventing this generation and future generations of boys in this community from becoming what the older generation is you know that's but, a heavy weight to put on yeah. someone's shoulders. Yeah, I don't have much to say about his character. I think he 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 acts it well. I think he does. There was Oscar talk about him, which I thought really? was yeah. I just it's extreme. It it's, is extreme. It is extreme. And I'm a weeper, so I would never comment on anybody just being weepy. But he's weepy. Yeah. <laughs> I won't do it, but I did it. You know, I won't <laughs> comment on it, but I. And to the point where I was like, was it a hundred percent necessary for the whole ending? We yeah. already, un- we understood in the yeah. first five seconds of how he looks at her, what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like the fact that she does. Now that said, is that because we are uncomfortable with men crying? Are we uncomfortable with a character expressing themselves that way? Are we not used to characters expressing themselves that way who are male? Is he supposed to show us that there's another side to men other than the men that we've already seen in this film? Well, obviously, yeah, it has to have some kind of balance. And, you know, not all men are uh, yeah. predators. And uh, unfortunately, the men who are predators are, are allowed to get away with it because other men just kind of stand on the sideline. And he is that to begin with, but then becomes something else through the process of watching the women do what they did. And, and he even says, I'm not here to put in, because they ask him his opinion later on. And he's like, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, I can't, uh, which is actually a very interesting uh, narrative choice that the man doesn't all of a sudden, once again, mansplain things and say, I know what's going on and this is what you should do. He's not there to do that. He's there. I think he functions as the teacher for basic education, meaning he he is thrilled by being a teacher. He loves sharing the information. Whether or not somebody in the community agrees with it or doesn't agree with it is not his to debate. He would stand on the side of a debate. Whether there's a book banning thing, he would stand on the, the side and say, I would love to teach you Shakespeare. I would love to teach you Hamlet. But if you're going to say it's something that it's not, I have nothing to say because all I'm here for is to teach you Hamlet. That said, I think it shows balance and it shows weight. And I questioned how I was 
uncomfortable with his weepiness. Mm -hmm. And I finger quoted on purpose because I do think when it comes down to it, I just have trappings of being raised male in this society that I have to work out. And I love the fact that Sarah Pauly does not pull any punches with it. She puts it in your face and she says, this is a representation of a good man, quintessentially a good person, period. And that's all I needed to take from him. Hmm. The extreme was the actor's choice and the director's choice. And I'll go with it because that's what they chose to do. Other than that, it's, it's very minimally important to me half a percent about this film i thought about him yeah tiny tiny percent the rest of it is so powerful you could have done without any of that subplot and i wouldn't have thought twice about it teacher yes subplot love of my life don't need it don't mm -hmm. need it at all i liked that it was there it gave yeah. her some um, uh, comparisons of what she could choose. She could choo choose somebody who's truly in love with her and live a happy life in the community, or she could move on. But she wasn't in love with him as he was in love with her. And yeah. that's a storyline, but not as important on any level as everything else well, going on in the film. And it's also her, uh, you know, I think, uh, Ona, the that Rooney Mara character, uh, taking fully in the, the the her capacity to make a choice and to have a say in where her life's gonna go, and you know he's he's essentially like giving her a get out of jail free card, and and saying like, and, and also of all the guys there, you know he may be the the safest guy to marry because she's pretty darn sure he's not gonna beat her you know, you know, at home and all that stuff and, be, you know, be mean to her and all that. So, I mean, it's, but, but she's ultimately, like you said, able to say like, but I don't have those feelings for you. And I'm not just, it's not just going to be a marriage of convenience or a marriage of safety. Like I want to actually go out and, you know, live my life or figure out what is out there for me. I want the and, choice to make choices. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that's kind of what they say at the end. They said, yeah. like, ultimately, it comes down to, you know, these three things. We want our children to be safe. We want to have a, a say in our lives. And uh, I can't remember what the third one was. <laughs> but but it was ultimately, I mean, it's very basic stuff. I mean, we're talking about, like, you know, bottom of the barrel, just, like, being human type stuff. Well, think of how sad that is. Yeah. That they have to, in 2023, make a film about women just wanting the basic necessities of being a human. Yeah. Still, to this day, we're still having these issues, and they're tremendous, and they are thunderous in people's lives, women's lives. So let's move on, if you don't mind. I don't know sure. where you want to go, but I want to go to Claire Foy's choice at the end of the film, because... It did not, it did not, I did not feel the weight of that until I was two or three days later. And I went, wait a second. Wow. How she like, horse tranquilized her son to take him. Yep. And I love her and I love her as an actress and only the line reading, he's my son, is so on point. It's... You know, we always say Oscar worthy or whatever, but that's meant to be a compliment to somebody being on point and meant to be they hit that and maybe only they could have hit it like that. And I'm sure a thousand other actresses could have hit it in a thousand different ways. But man, when she says it, I was like, wait, what? Wait, didn't she just do what they're fighting against them doing? Why is that in the movie? Why it does that, does that debunk everything else? That, or, that was going to be my question. Yeah, does that actually take, yeah, a chunk out of... But you know what? Movie? I thought, I kept thinking to myself, I will never be able to answer that question because I am a male person in this society. And I will never know the difference between what has been woven into my DNA and what I've tried to work out Throughout my whole entire life, what I've been educated and awakened to and aware of and listened to and be a part of the conversation, I want to be part of the conversation. That's my only responsibility. Mm -hmm. I don't want to have 
and, and expressed opinion if, unless asked otherwise. I want to listen to what people say when they're talking about things that don't go well in their lives. I don't want to say, oh, well, if you didn't do this, you could have done this. If you didn't do this, blah, 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 blah. So I don't know if I could even have a discussion about it because I will never, one, know that. And that might be a, a little bit of a, a cop-out mm. because you could still have it an is. opinion about it is. I agree. <laughs> I, I, no, I agree. I, I accept that. Boom. Well, but no, it, it, but and here's, here's, I think that there's a way to have an opinion on something without saying that it's the definitive answer. I was just getting ready to say the exact same thing, but you yeah. always do that. I speak for like 10 minutes and then you say one little line and you Shakespeare me out. No, uh, but I, no, no, no. It's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. Cause sometimes I listen to us and I'm like, thank gosh, Josh made sense about what I just said um, or clarified it in a definitive way. So I, I don't know. It. You go. Oh, um, I love it. I love everything <laughs> about that. But, she would love that too. And if she, <laughs> she would love it. Um, anyway, so I'm not trying to cop out. I'm just saying that maybe that's not the part of the film I really need to be listening to fully. I heard it. I saw it. I have questions about it, but let me listen to the rest of the film. Talk to me. Here we go. Finger quotes again. And let me listen to it before I get to my misunderstanding of how I took that segment, but I thought it was fascinating that it was in there because yeah. it really brings up so many questions. I don't even know where to begin. Well, I mean, as I thought about it, like over, like you said, over the last couple of days, I've thought about it and yeah, initially it's kind of like, oh my gosh, she's, it's the same thing. But, but it's not, though. I mean, and the reason why it's in there, I mean, one reason I think that I took from it or a, a, a piece that I took from it is that there, the way that the men were attacking the women was they were removing their bodily autonomy. They were removing the choice for the women to be able to interact with the men. Like, that's what they were removing. And I think that what Claire Foy is doing, what Salome is doing, is she's she's not removing her son's bodily autonomy because she wants to assault him. She's trying to, to save him. Essentially. She's trying to give him a chance to not be, uh, in drop doctrinated, whatever you want to call it, to not be, uh, you know, to, to give him a chance to, to live his own life instead of, uh, try instead of, uh, folding into this toxic environment. And so, um, so that's her, that's her rationale or ra her rationalization for preventing him from making, from being able to make a choice. So, I mean, you know, that's it's so it's, touchy. I mean, yeah. because if you're talking about choice, you can't, what's the word I'm looking for? You that's how they framed it you, though. They framed it. He had a choice whether to stay or whether to go. They, yeah. they talked about that. Uh, oh you know? yeah. And oh, so, yeah. She's she's removing his choice, which is interesting. Yeah, I don't know what it, else to say. It's interesting, but I will say this: I think it's maybe a, a subliminal thing in the film or subtext that the boy, the young man, is right teetering right on the edge of going one way or another way, and she yep. has removed the one influence that might mend make him bend this way. Okay, so that's a good thing. But one might be able to s discuss, and like I said, we started this podcast with saying we're two guys, we're two men, so what don't we know? What don't we understand? What have we not been able to grasp? Because one, we don't have to, and it's never given to us that way, and what do we need to listen to in this film that can help us grasp it and understand it is the essential thing that I'm taking from this film. That said, if you got a group of guys together, that's the point that they would be making. The Okay, I'm generalizing. I would, I'm assuming that that would be a point of contention with some men. It's hard to talk about it without generalizing because I don't know what all men would say, but my instinct would be they would cling on to that as an excuse for 
debunking, like you said, all the rest of the film. I, I, so I, yeah. f- I need to know why she put well, it in there. I would love I, I to think... just listen to why she put it in there. <laughs> well, I need I to mean, know. We, the, she may have even talked about it. I don't know. I haven't, like I said, I only watched it a couple of days ago. But, but I think that um, one thing that I think is is good about about that choice, her choice to to put something like that in there, is that we talk about this all the time. Where you know, when something looks too pristine, you know it's not real. Yeah. And in this scenario, with these women being, you know, you you don't want to make it seem like you know they're completely. Uh, pure and perfect and and don't have you know any flaws and don't have uh you know any uh you know wrinkles to 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 their to their beings they need to be real human beings and and so this is something that that a real human being would do that that a real mother would do she would do anything to save her son and and that's that was what she felt at the time was the only option for herself. And so in a, in a lot of ways, if you're trying to poke holes in this movie, you if that scene wasn't in there, you could poke holes in the movie and say like, well, it's fake anyway, because like, w- you know, people are a lot more complex than this. And, you know, you know, women aren't this, you know, uh, whatever you want to say word as, as somebody who's trying to poke holes in it. They're not this pure. They're not this, you know, whatever. And so that is something where, you know, uh, Sarah Polly puts that in there and it's like, yeah, they're real people. So this happened, this can happen to real people. And so, you know, it, take it seriously. And, and, and it's harder to, to, you know, pop that balloon when it, you make it that much stronger with, with real, uh, choices and, and yeah. See, I find that fascinating on so many levels because I think you're right. And I think that's a great explanation. I am now delving through my mind right now why my brain went to a certain place. Why did it go there? Why did I question that choice? My questions about that choice had nothing to do with what you just said. Thank goodness you just said that because now I can start thinking about it like that. But why did my brain go that way? Why, why, am, I, why am I conditioned, which makes it sound like I don't have a choice in it, choice again, or mm-hmm. a rationale uh, rationale towards, uh, saying, Oh, I'm, my DNA is woven with this societal imperfection. So I can't help but think that way. I don't ever want to be that person. I want to be said, I want somebody to say, Hey, you're, you're only thinking about that this way because maybe, or maybe you should think about it this way, or -hmm. maybe think about it this way. Instead of saying, you know, you shouldn't think about it that way or the reason why you're thinking about it that way. Here, think about it. Think about this possibly being the reason why. And I love the fact that you've come up with a logical reason why. Because it's about human beings being flawed and making choices based on their circumstances. And people make choices all the time that are not the best choices because that will get them in or out of a situation that they need to be in or out of. So I love the fact that you just wrapped that up like that for me. Mm-hmm. So thank you because I did question why, why am I all of a sudden being defensive about that? Why am I, fe- <laughs> you know, like why? Well, well, I mean, it's because you're a man and I'm a man and like, I don't, I wouldn't want to think that, that I would even have the capacity to do what these men did in this okay. story. Well, I will stop you. I don't, I've known you for eight years and I've known myself for 50 plus five decades around the sun. I know I don't have the capacity to do that to a human being. And I would almost 100%, uh, be on the side of that. You wouldn't be able to do it either. So I think there are some definitive things we can say about being men in the society. I never want to hurt anybody, yeah. uh, even not purposefully. I don't want to do it. I mean, and I have, and um, you know, I've said things and I've done things that were not the most mature choices in this world that have hurt people. But the capacity to do something like drug a person and physically abuse them—that's not in any. That's not even in any realm of my being mm-hmm. ever. For. Ever, I would have to be drugged or completely uh, lost my mind, and I still don't think I would do it. So that said, I still find it interesting that I felt a little d- defensive about it. But like you said, 
there are reasons why screenwriters do what they do. And you're right. If something is too polished, although you do see flaws of all the other characters throughout the, I mean, I think the smoking is a physical uh, manifestation of that. Um, And then you see what actually physically happens to her when she Mm. has a panic attack. And, Mm. you know, uh, Jesse Buckley could come across as a mean, cruel human being until you see that last scene, which is... Mm. I mean, come on. I was just listening to her on YouTube from um, uh, the Country Singer movie. Um, uh, Oh, yeah, yeah. Rose, uh, Wild Rose. Yes, thank you. Um, And her voice is so beautiful. And, you know, I'm not the biggest country music fan, but I was just singing along in my head, and it was beautiful, and she can sing. Um, Jesse Buckley, I I, I did want to say something. Her, Her best scene is when she's walking back to her house yep. with her kids yep. when her husband is in that house. Yep. And she's smiling. Yep. And she's she's keeping, you know, she's like keeping her kids' spirits up. Like she's, ugh, it's devastating. That's acting. Like mm. that's the goal to... You know, you can be nominated and you can have these accolades and you can be on stage and you can do all this stuff that people don't normally get to do and you can do all that. But when she looks back, I hope she realizes that people out there like us have recognized that moment right there. Mm. She's anyway, don't get me don't get me weepy. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe now is a good time to to. To end it, <laughs> the episode at least. So yes, I hear you. Um, so uh, all right, well, uh, you can check us out on the web at actorandengineer.com. Uh, you can go to facebook.com/slash actorandengineer. You can tweet us at actorengineer, and we're on YouTube. Just search for the Actor and the Engineer podcast, and we'll see you next time.